Hey everybody, I'm Dave Sandell. And I'm Caleb Gardner. And this is the Best Album for Podcast, a podcast where Caleb and I discuss the best album for getting work done at a coffee shop. So uh, today's episode uh, was a, a listener suggestion. Uh, my buddy Ted, who uh, was at a coffee shop recently, and they were playing exclusively reggae covers of popular songs and oh, really God. bad reggae covers of popular songs <laughs> and he was yes. dying inside slowly been while there being Ted. subjected <laughs> been there i think i've had that exact thing happen like being in a coffee shop with reggae covers playing so why is that like, a go-to for coffee I shops i do not know i think it's just a like i don't think they really think about like are we setting the mood for people to work i think it's like is this the right vibe for what we're trying to get out of our cafe? And if we want to be, you know, a cheap reggae cover cafe, then we're going to play cheap reggae covers. But who invests the amount of money that it costs to start one of these coffee shops so that they can be a cheap reggae cover in? I always think who invests the amount of money to create all these terrible reggae covers of popular songs? Like who wants this? That's real. Who asked for this? (laughs) Do you have a favorite reggae cover of a popular song? Oh, God. No, I don't. I thought you were searching your inventory. I was. I was genuinely searching. I was thinking, do I? Do I? No. I have a favorite of a lot of things. Maybe there is one somewhere in there. I mean, do you consider... Okay, okay. Genuine question. Do you consider Somewhere Over the Rainbow, co- the cover of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, reggae? Oh, like the ukulele one? Yes. You yes. know what's interesting That's is that... Re- reggae, No, right? it's not reggae. No, no, no. I'm sure... Well, I don't know exactly what he was hearing, but I would not consider that reggae. I'm guessing yeah. there was it was much more dubby what he was yeah. listening to. That I mean, reggae it's, it's isn't like island. Hawaiian. Yeah, it's, it's an island, island. But it's not not really reggae. No, no, not at all. Yeah. But was that going to be your go-to? Because that song is, it's like, it's fine. It's, I guess, it was, it was yeah, really it was, sweet. It was the only other one that I could think of that was like a semi-decent, okay, like this is on par with maybe the original song in my enjoyment of it. It doesn't mean the original song is like a great song and that's a great song it's like you you asked me a question dave i was trying to find an answer i'm not going to subject the listeners to a cue right now of us dropping in some reggae music (laughs) but if you need to take a minute to go listen to that so you can you're getting you know what you're you're getting a preview of the text chain between me and dave where he's (laughs) like uh what about this and i'm like this what about that this (laughs) we only do back and forth all the time (laughs) it's true it's true <laughs> I'm telling you, this podcast was made partially so that I can list things on the air. <laughs> I'm just going to so list true. names of artists. I've, I've got a big honorable mention list today. My honorable mention list runs like I'm not going to list them all, but it runs like 40 deep. Like it's I believe uh, that because it's a genre. It's not really about the bands. It's about yeah. the genre. So I'll spare. I, the I have strong feelings about the genre, and based on your pick. I have strong feelings about your pick that I'm very interested to get into because Excellent. I think that we have approached this very differently. Yeah. And I want to, I'm ready, ready to get into it. Oh yeah. Well, let's do oh, it. Yeah. I actually think that you, so I should start with the caveat of I very rarely go to a coffee shop to get work done. That is not a place that I do well in. I don't flourish there. Uh, I get super distracted by everything that's happening. I find the seating very ah. uncomfortable. I feel a lot of pressure to keep buying stuff and I don't really drink coffee to begin with. So the things yes. that I have to buy are either like tea, which fine, I don't really want to drink tea, but I'm willing to buy it so that I can keep using your Wi-Fi. But right. I don't get any enjoyment out of the tea. So I just I just largely stay away from coffee shops. So this was more of a, a mental exercise of, well, if I had to, and they had reggae music on, what would I toss on my headphones <laughs> to drown it out and be able to actually get some work done? So you are still thinking about what's in your headphones, not like what's playing. Well, right? so I think we should talk about that. So so you have a significant wealth of experience working in coffee shops, is my I do. understanding. Yeah. So yeah, I do. So I think you should actually set the tone today. Like what were your criteria you were thinking of as you as you went through this list? Yeah, good question. I mean, I I I enjoy working in coffee shops. Like I I I enjoy the milieu. I like being around other people that I feel like are you know, there to be creative. I like coffee. I'm a coffee drinker. So being at a coffee shop and having great coffee is great. I don't love that it makes me spend ungodly amounts of money to stay there. Um, so that is one reason why I don't do it a lot currently. I, I don't just mean like they pressure you. Like some places obviously will pressure you to keep spending money in order to keep having the Wi-Fi and all that. I don't really love that vibe. But 
even if I'm there, I'm just going to spend money. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to keep buying coffee. I'm going to buy snacks, whatever. So like that part I don't love. But do I love the environment in general? Yes. Is it a productive environment for me? Usually. Yeah. What do you love about it? I'm not a person that likes silence or like quiet when I work. You know, like, I I don't know what it is about how my brain works, but I need that like ambient noise um, to have like to, to this is why i put noise or like music on in my office at home right like i need i need something or else i go crazy like in college i was the same way like quiet library no noisy coffee shop i'm there um so when i am in a quiet library environment i will often put on my headphones and attempt to create some kind of coffee shop like atmosphere for just me oh okay interesting so you're trying to reproduce something that i'm trying to get away from a little bit yeah that's a very interesting <laughs> That's a yeah. very interesting situation. I mean, when I was in college, I would attempt to work at the library. I would attempt to work at the student union and, you know, a whole host of other places. And they all were terrible. Like, I just struggled to get work done in any of those situations. I think I just need, like, me alone in a room where I can, mm. like, disappear into the work. That's the only way I ever yeah. actually accomplished it. So it sounds anything. like just being in public in general is not great for you. Is that what you're trying it's to say? It's not awesome. I mean, I like <laughs> being in public in general. But not to get work done. But not to get work done, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's I would being... really struggle with that. Yeah, that's interesting. There's um, a uh, a quiet room at our library that I think is essentially meant to be like a, a, a little space that you can go to if you just need like a break from, you know, the noise of the world. But there's also like a prayer mat in there. And, and you know, there's I, – it strikes me sometimes when I reserve that little quiet room that maybe I'm not the target audience of the quiet room, but I sure <laughs> love that quiet room. <laughs> I think what uh, honestly keeps me um, at home working in my office now is that I'm a snob about my like screen setup. Now I'm like a double monitor. I like like, you know what I mean? I've got all my technology. And when I go to a coffee shop, I'm either getting frustrated about the Wi-Fi connection and or my like tiny little laptop screen. I'm like, oh, I just want my just want my like setup. Have you ever seen a person come into a coffee shop? And actually bring like a whole monitor set up with them. Have you been witness to this? No. Has that happened to you? 100%. I have seen people walk into <laughs> their a coffee shop and set it up as if they are at their home office. And I've never been a brave enough or shameless enough soul to do that myself. Okay. I have a couple questions for you. When you're at a coffee shop and you have to go to the bathroom, do you take your gear with you? Like, do you <sighs> take your laptop with you? Or do you trust that it's going to be there when you get back? This is a this is a big struggle with coffee shop working. Usually, usually I will just leave it and come back and trust that it is a busy enough space and no one's just going to take my shit. But if it if it is something super expensive like like if I've got my nice like MacBook there, I'm definitely nervous about just like leaving it around. Um so it, d- it definitely depends on the environment. Sometimes I will ask like a kind stranger to watch my things or depending on the environment, like a waiter to watch my things. Um, so, yeah, it depends. Usually, honestly, the move is just like pee before you sit down, man. Like that's what I. <laughs> that's yeah, what but I then do. you're filling yourself full of coffee. <laughs> but then you exactly. It's, that's the problem with, with being there for a long time. <laughs> All right. So you you're in the coffee shop. Do you find yourself more regularly leaving your headphones off and just listening to whatever's on the radio or not the radio, whatever's on the sound system and just like enjoying the atmospheric noise of people chatting or whatever else, or do you disappear into your headphones? And if you do, do you turn the noise canceling on? Ooh, good question. Um, Usually I will put my headphones on, but not even so much about the music. It's because I'll start like listening to other people's conversations and that will be what distracts me. Um, so, but if if the conversation like it's not really clear, like there's not someone sitting right next to me having a conversation that I need to drown out or something like that, and the music isn't terrible, I will kind of just like work in the coffee shop atmosphere. So, what types of music do you aim at? I'm not necessarily asking what your pick is here, but mm-hmm. are you genre agnostic here? Do you have, you know, are all of your go tos kind of similar sounding? What what is your what is your go-to stuff when you are at a coffee shop? I would say, so this is this is actually where I think there's a disconnect between our picks today. Because I think that I go for energy 
over the location. So I don't know that it matters when I'm at home or when I'm at a coffee shop. I'm looking for something. If I'm like looking to dig into work, I'm looking for something energetic and that's going to get me like, hell yeah, let's do this, you know, like really pumped up. And it becomes about like the, the, the uh, music to match the energy for the work I want to do, not necessarily the music to match the location. Does that make sense? I think so. I mean, I, I guess <laughs> I can't necessarily relate, but I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, uh, do you aim for things that are instrumental or do, are you fine hearing lyrics? Sometimes. No, I'm, I'm actually generally fine hearing lyrics if I know the music well. I don't listen to new music when I'm trying to do work. Oh, and then I will pay. This, yeah. yeah, I will pay a lot more attention to the music than I need to for like the work that I'm trying to do. If I'm at home or if I'm like doing shallow work, you know, like sending emails or something like that, then I might put on like a new album because I don't really need a lot of mental energy to focus on that stuff. Um, but if I'm like digging into something, like trying to write, for example, no way. I cannot have like new music, new lyrics. That will completely distract me. I can put on old music that I know very well that just kind of fits like, you know, and I was going to say fits like an old blanket. That can't be the idiom that is like, well, it fits like a glove, but fit, but I'm I just think mixing that, uh, my metaphors. I think an old blanket is an apt metaphor here. Like yes. it's, it's, you wear nice it like an old blanket, maybe. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Wear it like an old blanket. I don't know if I've heard that one, but I don't, I don't know. I it don't, sounds right. It sounds good. But you get what I'm saying is that I it do. is comfortable and I don't have to put a lot of mental energy into it because I know it so well. And it's that that music works well for me in a, in a coffee shop setting. But it still can't be like low key mellow. It's got to be like upbeat, energetic. That's very that's an different. important part of me for this for like working in general. So I think that that is really coloring my like being in a coffee shop, because if I'm in a coffee shop, I'm still trying to kind of drown out people and get a, get work done. And I need something that like is going to tr- propel me forward. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually thought that this was going to be, this is probably our most relatable topic that we've covered, but also maybe the hardest one to find a universal recommendation for. I attempt maybe, yeah. to, I attempt to ignore my tastes when I make my, my long list. Like when I'm just like thinking about what's all the music that might potentially fit this topic. And then I kind of bring my taste into it uh, from there. And I have this sense of the thing I'm going to pick today might not be for everyone. It probably isn't for everyone. Uh, It sounds like it's not for you. (laughs) It sounds like we might be going there tonight. Uh, And then, you know, certainly some of the stuff that you sent me as like preliminary picks, I was like, I can never, I can never, (laughs) I can never get any work done. I mean, I could do shallow work like what you're talking about, but I can never get deep work done. You know, with any, any, like, it's not necessarily they can't be up tempo, but it has to be, for me, it has to be steady and non intrusive. Like, it has Mm. to kind of create a background where I can generally ignore it, but it still has to, like, I have to be able to put the work on top of it. And so, it has to be at least get me into a like a headspace or a vibe where I'm going to be able to best get work done, you know. So it's a lot of electronic music, of course. Like that's I just need beats. Um, sure. I want like steady hip hop beats uh, the whole time if I can. <laughs> uh, and you know, as long as the music that's being built on top of those hip hop beats isn't super annoying and you know attention grabbing. I can generally let it fade into the background, which is what I'm aiming for. Unless yeah. I'm making something so specific that I want something, you know, like a, a deep, dark, classical, haunting piece of music. Uh, you know, there's certainly times that I reach for those things, but that's not coffee shop work. That's like, that's like yeah. deep in a, you know, a, a writing work or something like that. Yeah, I hear that. Um, and and your pick certainly fits that what you were just <laughs> like describing as your criteria. And um, I will actually preview. I actually really liked it. Oh, okay. But but not for this topic. Okay. Well, let me let me jump into my pick. I actually don't have a ton to say about it. So I'm gonna pick tonight uh, Mark Farina's Mushroom Jazz Volume Four. All right, fine. Now this is a a compilation record that that he put together um, with some of his stuff and then some of other people's stuff, and it's all mixed. Uh, together um, in a way that you can kind of press play and it never 
will really come to a stop. It'll just play continuously. And in fact, if you go find these albums on like Apple Music or whatever, they're actually presented often as one long continuous mix, which I really appreciate because I can't skip ahead if I wanted to. Like I can't like just I can't get to a place where I'm like, ah, this song's annoying. Let me just press next. I'd have to like go search for something, in which case I just say forget it. I'll just keep listening to it. It's fine. <laughs> and you know, ultimately it moves on. Um, but this is a collection of Mark Farina's uh, stuff that he started doing in the early 90s. It was born out of like house music and acid jazz and and down tempo music that he was creating as not necessarily an antidote to the other house music that was happening in Chicago at the time. And in San Francisco, I think a lot of this stuff was made in San Francisco, uh, not necessarily as an antidote to that, but uh, as sort of a another alternative. Um, so he would what he would do was uh, he would go to these these houses or these warehouses or whatever he was you know, invited to, you know, whatever club space he was in, would often have multiple rooms going. And the multiple rooms would be playing different types of music. And almost all the rooms were playing house music. And so when he was invited to take over a room, he said, I don't really want to just play more house music. Let me, you know, create something that's something a little bit different uh, that people can come in and kind of take a break to. So they would come in, they'd sit on beanbag chairs and they'd, you know, consume whatever things they were consuming uh and they would just kind of <laughs> chill out for a minute to this type of music and then they'd be able to go back in and dance and do whatever and else that's how it got its title right well <laughs> that's right actually that. yep yeah. <laughs> so he was definitely into psychedelics and things like that and he created this uh style called mushroom jazz and uh eventually he didn't have the spaces to you know, make these eight, 10 hour sets in anymore. And so I think my understanding is he started putting them together as mixtapes um, and selling in places and ultimately became kind of this long gestating series. I think there's like eight volumes at this point. And all of them are to my ears, almost indistinguishable from the others. I'm picking number four because that's the first one I heard. And it's the one I reach for because I'm nostalgic uh, for I it. I was going to ask. Yeah. Uh, interesting. <laughs> but there's nothing. There's, I think that number four, I think volume four is probably where he, uh, I think it's his best continuous mix, but I, you know, you put on volume one. I don't even know if I could tell you it was volume one and not volume four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So you can kind of throw any of these on and that's kind of nice. You can make a playlist of all eight volumes and just let it play all day long. And I reach for this stuff in a lot of different settings. Um, but, you know, that kind of coffee shop need to get work done, need to like let the background noise dial down a little bit. Um, just need to kind of sink into my work. I, I heard uh, this guy talk one time about the way he does work is he's a deep sea diver and it takes him hours to get down to the, to like the bottom area of the deep sea where he's actually going to find the treasures. Um, and it takes him so long to get down there that if he's interrupted, he has to come, you know, if somebody knocks on the door, he has to like come all the way back up to the surface and answer that question that might take that, you know, it might take two minutes, but then it takes him more, several more hours to get back down to where he was. And I think that's kind of how I work. I need like a long period of being in a groove before I really hit the sweet stuff. Uh, and so this music just allows me to, to go there. Um, maybe a little bit quicker, even I, I might even be able hmm. to get there a little bit quicker, uh, because it's familiar and it's old. This music does not sound current or modern in any sense. This sounds like the music you heard, you know, in any hip place in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, but that's what probably, I loved about it. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> of good like stuff. Very there. nostalgic. Absolutely. And then, you know, there's a whole, I'm going to do an honorable mention list later. There's a whole, you know, uh, there's 20, 30, 40 groups from the early 2000s that were making kind of down tempo music that I really love. And I could just put any of them on uh, in these coffee shop settings and that would be fine. But the thing that I'd find myself reaching for now, I don't know if you, are you familiar with lo-fi hip hop beats that you can study to? on youtube oh yeah totally so i reach for that more than more than most things like that's if i just need to get some work done i'll often just hit play on the youtube video that's been i think now they've been disrupted a few times but at one point they have been continuously going for years and it amassed millions of views you know a hundred thousand <laughs> at a time or something like that or twenty thousand at a time uh and i just find that this music is not challenging <laughs> it's it's i mean it's right there in the title it's a lo-fi hip-hop radio beats uh you know there's no real meat on the bone uh 
there's a there's a Reddit board where people just constantly are throwing more and more stuff up that they're creating in their homes. It does not seem nice. like the barrier of entry is very high, uh, you know, to create something that sounds decent enough to get thrown into that mix. And I really respond to that type of music when I'm in that, like, just need to get something done place. So this is like kind of in my head, the birthplace of that, this mushroom jazz mix to my ears sounds like the beginning of what would eventually become this lo-fi hip hop kind of jazzy mix that, that a lot yeah, of that makes sense. Like the out. ancestor of it. Yeah, I think so. And so that was my pick. Uh, I got to admit though, uh, I just can't remember the last time I went to a coffee shop and tried this out. <laughs> so this is a this is a better one for like That's you know best album but... for getting stuff done in my room yeah. <laughs> than getting stuff done in a coffee shop. Uh, that being said, certainly I've done this before at a coffee shop and it's been fine. I feel like this is, this is so so betraying you and I's different working styles too. It's fascinating yeah. um, because it, well, my follow up question naturally is: Can you work with things with lyrics, or do you always? aim for things that don't have any words at all yeah that's a good question i so i can i can um but not, there can't be a distinct voice for sure um why am i having trouble answering that question it's because i have a million examples of of artists that i listen to sometimes that have lyrics and so I, for me to put a blanket statement out there that no i need to sure, not have sure. lyrics would be incorrect but I will say that I, I get distracted by it. Like I, I get pulled in by the lyrics and I get pulled in by the singing uh, in ways that I don't get pulled in, you know, by this kind of slow study. You know, it's interesting because your pick is going to be also instrumental, but there's so much liveliness to it and it's moving and constantly shifting and changing that I would get so distracted by that. Like it would be hard not to just stop and listen to the music. And so <laughs> I tend to go for stuff that is just non-threatening. <laughs> so the vocals non are non-threatening. That's funny. Um, you know, I think about like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of artists that just remix other people's work. And I find their, their style to be so compelling that I just sort of amass these huge playlists of all of their remixes. And some of them have created albums, you know, album length, album length releases of their remixes and thinking about like Kruder and Dorfmeister or, you know, DJ Cozy, who's like my, you know, mm -hmm. one of my three or four favorite musicians of all time. Uh, and I can kind of listen to their stuff because the voice becomes an instrument. The voice isn't there to be a voice. It's there to just be one of many things. I also probably can put on stuff that I deeply love. There's, you know, there's older albums that I love like Radiohead that I've heard those lyrics so many times that, you know, they don't necessarily distract me. Uh, I don't get pulled in as easily by them. Um, so I guess I can have lyrics, but I prefer not. I mean, I sort of search for stuff and catalog it. Uh, you know, with the, oh, I can, I can throw this on sometime because there's yeah. no lyrics. Yeah, that's fascinating. I don't know that I necessarily default to no lyrics usually, but I find that the music that I will put on while I'm working sometimes naturally has no lyrics because like this album and it's not, I'm not putting it on because it has no lyrics. I'm putting it on because it's got the kind of energy I'm looking for. But I do, I do think that I probably listen to, to music without lyrics more often when I'm looking for that vibe in general. Um, and there's like a certain, certain situations where I will look for that kind of music, but they're kind of few and far between. So this, this album or, or albums like it, you said you probably wouldn't put on in this kind of get work done in a coffee shop setting. So why? Like, tell me why. No, well, and the reason it's too continuous. This is what's, so there's two reasons. One is I find the energy to be so laid back. Like my, my first thought when I was listening to this is, oh my God, I love this. But like, I need to be drinking scotch and playing poker with my friends. <laughs> you know, like I don't need to that'd be, a, that'd be a cool room. Right. And I, I don't need, I need to be doing that. I don't, I couldn't get work done. Like I'm too, like, this is too laid back for me. So that, that was the main reason. And then the other is the, I mean, related to that is the, you're right. The tempo is just it's so continuous that I think I'd actually get more distracted by that. Does that make sense? Like after a while I would be like, okay, well I've heard this for a long time. Now I need to put something else on, you know, if I, uh, if I could just have, and one of the things I like doing is just putting this on for eight hours. Like just, you know, just let this <laughs> run the whole work day. Uh, wow. 
and uh that's that's heaven because i i just it's going you know it's 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 always there it's always yeah. if i'm and if i'm at a breaking point where i just need a minute you know i i'm stuck i can't think through something if i pause i'm not going to be distracted by music but it's pleasant enough to like listen to for a few minutes do you do you actually go like eight hours uninterrupted no, on no, no. some work days i was gonna <laughs> say like well, that would be so, so impressive the only thing the only version of that was when i was working at the church um i had a, a thousand hats that i wore there and it was really easy i i got tuned into this concept of um urgent work and important work um yeah and I, there was just always urgent work. Like there was urgent work all the time, every day, enough to yep. fill three or four full-time jobs. And so I could go weeks or even months without ever hitting the important work that would actually help, you know, the, the church down the road or help my, you know, my workflow down the road. I can go months without touching that stuff because there's so much urgent stuff. So eventually I decided that Thursdays were going to be my important day and where I was essentially going to build in like a half hour at the beginning of the day for urgent work that like just absolutely had to be done. Like you would respond to an email, whatever it was. And then I would build in like, you know, a little bit of time right when I went to lunch and then a little bit of time at the end of the day. But otherwise the whole day was blocked off for important work. And I just didn't allow myself to touch any of the urgent work. And those days I would sometimes, you know, nine, nine thirty press play on something and, you know, it would still be playing at 4 p.m. Um, wow. Cause I was just in it. Yeah. I, you know, that was my intention. I probably had like 12 of those days total in 10 years <laughs> or 12 years, however long right. I was there. <laughs> yeah. Those are rare for any of us. I, I've heard of, of that concept, but I've always, I've always known it as deep work versus shallow work, which I think goes back to your friend's metaphor of like diving, right? Like going down into it and then being pulled back out and having to go back deep again. Um, I just want to name. Yeah. He's not my friend. He's a major author. <laughs> I never met him. <laughs> your your very Donald good Miller. friend. Yeah, my very That's good really friend funny. Donald Miller. <laughs> <laughs> your bestie. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I have uh, so much to say about your pick. And none right. of it has to do with anything with working. So I want to talk <laughs> about it in the right context first. And then I just want right. to have a really fun conversation about it for like 10 minutes. So <laughs> let's switch over to your pick because I'm excited. Yeah, let's do it. So um, along those lines of like looking for the right energy, I picked Birth of the Cool by Miles Davis. <laughs> think is probably my second favorite miles davis album behind kind of blue but it's kind but it's like i have a hard time picking between them because they're so different vibes um and and so different like contexts in which you could listen to it but i think i came to kind of blue first like i, I gotta give some context for like how i got into miles davis and in, and really jazz in general like it was really one of those like discovery periods in I think it was in college. It might have been late high school, but I'm pretty sure it was college where I was just like, I have to like jazz. I just have to, you know, like I was like, I love music. I don't know much about jazz. I need some kind of entry point. What's a good entry point? Oh, maybe like the best selling jazz record ever. (laughs) And, you know, I I always thought Miles Davis was cool as hell, even though I didn't know much about him. So I kind of like went down the rabbit hole of Miles Davis first, Um, put kind of blue on, instantly fell in love with it. And then they like, spent a not insignificant time. Yeah, I, this had to be my freshman year because now I'm getting memories about it. Like a not insignificant amount of time going down the rabbit hole of Miles Davis in particular, jazz in general. And not just like instrumental jazz, but like vocal jazz, like Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, like the Frank Sinatra. Um, so I think Birth of the Cool, I've probably put on the most often because I love it so much in this work context. Like it starts off with move, which is just so aptly titled and so energetic and so like in your face right away. Um, and just so like such a good, like um, that's what I'm looking for. Like cornerstone of this like cool jazz, like early fifties, like feel right. Like you feel like you're supposed to be like snapping your fingers in the back of some kind of smoky, you know, jazz club when you're listening to uh, Birth of the Cool. Um, it, it was so dif- dif- 
definitive, like it's such a definitive album for the 1950s and for jazz in general. And it, and just to give you a little bit of history, it was recorded in three sessions from 1949 to 1950, but not actually released as Birth of the Cool, the LP, until 1957. So it was released kind of in individual chunks up until then. And it was the really the first kind of quote unquote cool jazz record, which was kind of running contrary to a lot of the East Coast feels in terms of like bebop and Latin jazz in New York City. Um, so it really became, again, a defining album of the decade. Have you ever is... gone back and listened to the bebop stuff? Sometimes, yeah. I like really struggle with it. It is so fast. And so intense. And it's, I mean, they're amazing musicians, but it's so fast that I needed this like cool era, Miles Davis, just to slow it down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is like definitely my wavelength. But it still has flavors of that, right? Like that's what I like sure. with Move, right? Like it's just, it's, it is very fast, but you're right that this is, this does like portend what would end up becoming the Miles Davis of the kind of blue era. Um, but I don't know. I just, I'm really, this very few things make me want to live in the 1950s. Let's just be honest. Uh, but being around when Miles Davis was playing this, oh my god! Yeah, dream. I think Miles Davis would probably prefer not to have to have lived in the 1950s. But <laughs> right, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be fun to see him. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I think that I I've always, I mean, always been a fan of Miles Davis ever since then and have gone down deep in his catalog um, in lots of ways and he got super experimental and like he just had so many different eras like just wild but I still think I mean call me basic but I still think this uh, this era might have been my favorite hmm. I was uh, I, I remember very vividly getting on the corner for Christmas one year and like sitting on my grandma's couch after they'd gone to bed and putting my headphones on and listening on the corner. I never heard it before. And uh, just being like, whoa, this is new and different. And I love it. And it was, you know, at that point, 40, 50 years old. Yeah. But it felt so, so like, new, modern and ahead of its time and futuristic <laughs> even then. Like, it was just wild. I loved I loved all the iterations of Miles Davis. Yeah. Uh, you know, I kind of blew also, you know, an easy top 20 record for me. It, it's you know, just, just, I've just lived with it for so long. I've lived with yeah. it since I was a teenager or even, even before that. And I started listening to jazz music, um, pretty early on because it was, I might've already told the story, but it's essentially the only thing available at our public library. And at our public library, we could, we could check out music. Uh, and so I would just check out dozens of CDs. So I guess it must have been like high school when I really dove into this. You know, I, I would just check out dozens of CDs at a time. And it was either classical music or jazz music. And I didn't at the time have, a, you know, I just didn't have the capacity to appreciate classical music the way that I could now. Um, but I really got jazz. And so I would just come home with dozens of, you know, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and, you know, Thelonious Monk records uh, or CDs. And I would just play them all and just get this like, a kind of haphazard musical history lesson. <laughs> and I would go on like, you know, AOL and try to piece together when this stuff came out and, you know, what the lineage was and all of those things. Awesome. Uh, but when I found, when I found kind of blue, you know, like it does for everybody. That record is one of the best selling albums of all time. And it has not lost a step. Like it is not no, it really diminished hasn't. by that fact. Like most albums that are that wildly popular and have hit that many people have usually lost something in the translation. Like the, we can't really appreciate what makes them amazing anymore because they've taken on a life of their own. Yeah. I actually think kind of blue is the like clear exception to that where it's it's still perfect like it's still there's still nothing better and i feel like for every other best selling of all, album of all time there's tons of things that were better that just didn't sell as many copies <laughs> sure kind of lose it though but for but for birth of the cool i can't imagine going to a coffee shop and getting <laughs> anything done while these guys like wail on their horns <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if they were playing live. No, I'm saying not. even as a, on my headphones, like I just can't imagine that. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I just I think this just comes down to the different working styles. Like I think my I think my days end up being structured like and you you know this, you've seen my calendar. Like I've got I've got so many meetings and like so many things demanding my time that when I do have that like 
precious hour that I've got to go in, dive down deep fast and get a lot done in a short amount of time. I'm looking for something to like give me. I'm, I'm looking for a shot of espresso. This is the thing. I'm looking for a shot of espresso. And I feel like uh, mushroom jazz was like decaf. I'm not looking. I'm not looking for decaf right it's now. It's like sleepy time tea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Chamomile in the middle of your day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, I also list. I like will reach for like hardcore punk. Like these are these are like you know I'm really am looking for that like um, shot of energy when I work. So like that, these are the kind of things I reach for. I was trying to imagine what, why this record, uh, Mushroom Jazz, stuck out to me as perfect for a coffee shop specifically. And I was trying to imagine, would I like it if it was playing ambiently in the coffee shop? And I don't 100% know that I would. I feel oh, like that coffee shop would be trying to be hip in a way that I would be annoyed with. <laughs> but <laughs> it actually does feel like this is the right space for it. Like the right space for it is communal. And yeah, the right space for it agreed. is like, okay, let's like, let's just relax for a minute. And, you know, for me, relaxing and like being relaxed and getting things done is often a really nice space to be in. If I'm not stressed, if I'm just like enjoying the work and, you know, maybe alive, like lively, but not necessarily like manic, <laughs> uh, that's a really good spot for me to be in. And so if I do need to go to a coffee shop and get some work done, which I, I do have to do from time to time, uh, this is a nice thing to have on as I get those things done. Um, if you went into a coffee shop and they were playing birth of the cool or, or anything like it, uh, over the the sound system would that be a positive thing for you 100 percent. yeah i would be like yes this is my vibe let's do it and i think if they were playing mushroom jazz i'd be like oh this is awesome this is great and then i'd put something more energetic in my (laughs) headphones but i don't i don't necessarily see it as like not appropriate for that situation it's just like because you're you're you know you're trying to create a relaxing communal vibe but like you know i'm gonna go ahead and put my thing in my headphones and rage and drown all you out so i can get some work done as fast as possible so you're writing a book and listening to birth of the cool 100 percent. yes did it many times that's so fascinating <laughs> to me the way that your mind can, I think, can process all I, of those things i think the two things i probably listened to honestly the most while i was writing my book were birth of the cool or minor threat <laughs> those were the two <laughs> those were my probably two those are go-to different writing albums so when you when you pull you know birth of the cool in do you feel like it's it's aiding your work in a meaningful way like it's are you able to achieve something or or like reach for something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do you know what i'm asking that's such a good question would it is it is it aiming is it aiding me in a way that is is helping me reach for something that I wouldn't have reached for otherwise? I don't know that that's the case. I just think it's helping me like get in the right mindset to do it faster. I mean, I think that <laughs> I, I know faster I keep saying that. The... I know I keep saying that. But I one thing I've learned about myself, especially like learning about my ADHD, is that. I've always used urgency as a driver for like focus. Like we will, people that have brains like me will literally wait till the last minute because that's when we are the most focused. We'll like, we'll use that like pressure and like thrive in those moments. I remember, I remember one of the papers that I wrote in college, I wrote overnight the night before it was due, like literally started it and finished it overnight the night before it was due. And I got the best grade out of any paper that I've written. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, it was, that's fair, <laughs> but did I sleep? No. Did it, is it healthy? Absolutely not. <laughs> but like, but that's what I, I was kind of like. My question is, was it, you know, was it your best work? Like, like, you know, I actually think that was my best work in college. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, and I don't mean to like interrogate your, your, your thesis statement here. I just wonder, <laughs> like, uh, I guess for me, I should just say this. I'm not going to, I don't, I don't know how you work. Uh, for me, when I, I also thrive under, under urgency and deadlines, but I thrive in a way that isn't synonymous with flourishing. Like I thrive in the sense of, <laughs> I actually get it done. And usually yeah. I'm like good enough at it that it's done pretty well. But yes. I've sometimes wondered like, 
wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be it like led to my flourishing if I could have like devoted the correct amount of time to this and not waited till the last minute and only had last minute energy I for think, it? I think I have come to the realization over many, many years of working. Um, one, I'm attracted to to the same like just professions that have a lot of urgency and deadlines. Like I think I just I thrive in those environments. Um but I think sometimes it is true that, oh, I'm like doing something last minute. I'm like, oh, shit, I should have started this earlier. I'm not going to, you know, this isn't going to be my best work. Um, and sometimes it isn't. And I think it, it's really hard to tell which. And I should probably just plan on the like giving myself more time than I thought I would need. That's probably just generally true. <laughs> That's fair. So I, I'm, I'm curious about, I want to hear some honorable mentions in a minute, but one last thing, when you went through your Miles Davis journey, uh, how did you process like Bitches Brew or, you know, um, In a Silent Way or Sketches of Spain? Like, did they, did they feel like your mind was just being expanded every time you went on to the next record? I honestly, like, I think I found those records less accessible I don't think I don't think I had to your point about classical music. I kind of see it in that genre where it's like I don't think I had the ability to appreciate it yet. Mm. I think I came to those albums in terms of appreciation, at least a little bit later in life. For sure. I, w- I remember going to on the corner. I wanted to hear on the corner because it was often talked about as a birthplace of electronic music. I don't know if it's the birthplace ah. of electronic music, but that there were a lot of ideas that he was playing around with that would later resurface in electronic music. And so that was compelling to me. Like I wanted to, to hear that and it's all there. Like he, you know, he was inventing things, creating things that were, you know, miles, miles ahead good grief that were, <laughs> there's just light years <laughs> ahead of what everybody else was doing. Um, I remember hearing some of those records at the time, uh, you know, when I was a teenager or whenever and, and thinking like, this is, uh, this is better than the music that I listen to now. Like this is better than that, you know, Space Hog album that I really liked. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is better than all the Red Hot Chili Peppers records that I own. And yet I kind of appreciated why it died, like why mm. it didn't, it couldn't sustain in a monoculture setting. Like it was so intricate and, and nuanced and uh, challenging that it's not super shocking to me that it didn't like flourish it does seem like lots of amazing things have been built on the back of it. <clears throat> but I sometimes feel like we, I, I, I lament that we don't have that anymore. Like it feels like there's not a ton of analogs for the type of work that Miles Davis was doing and had space to do um, in, in our mm. popular musicians now. And he was a popular musician. Like he was, he was in, in, you know, a beloved musician by, by many, many people. And so That's I feel like we question. don't have a lot of analogs. What would be the analog? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's the analog is some like artist we've never heard of dropping their tracks on SoundCloud or something. But you're right. They like wouldn't have the popularity of Miles Davis in that era, you know, like um, wouldn't have the like credibility. Um, you know, it's almost like almost like a Miles Davis in the same breath as like Andy Warhol, where he's like making art and half the time you don't know what it is, but everyone's still going to his parties, you know, like there's no, yeah. there's no SoundCloud artist that's doing that for, <laughs> for sure. Like you've got to yeah. build, you've got to build a following and, you know, building a following online means playing things that people like for the most part, mm-hmm. um, trying to find an audience for something. Um, and sometimes you can create an audience for new things. And sometimes it's really, really, really hard to do that. I have often wondered, like, there was such a, um, there's such a large group of the greatest musicians of all time living in the same place at the same time, producing the same kind of music. I've often wondered, like, what, what created that setting? Like, when I think about, you know, when I, when I first discovered, like, John Coltrane records and Thelonious Monk and, and Charles Mingus, I love Charles Mingus, uh, you know, hearing all of that stuff and then Bill Evans and, and discovering that all these guys all knew each other and played together and like pushed each other to some extent. And, you know, I I actually prefer listening to John Coltrane on other people's albums because John Coltrane's solo work, giant steps excluded, but thinking about like love Supreme, John Coltrane's 
uh, solo work is so challenging and so intense um, that it's it's sometimes I find it a little hard to listen to. But mm. there's no question that he is a, a genius, and he just like would show up on other people's records all the time. And it wasn't like you know dropping in like guest spots like Kendrick Kendrick Lamar. Like these guys were all <laughs> creating together. They were like building yeah. something together. And I, I, I've wondered like what led to that. Um, what's the right word here? Like that incubation or that, uh, yeah, that setting where, where so much flourishing was happening within this specific space at the same time. Yeah. Uh, cause it had to be more than just like, these were preternaturally the greatest musicians ever. I, yeah. I think that's maybe, maybe true, but there was something that allowed them to flourish all, yeah. all at once. There's been, there's been milieus like that of like artistic creation all throughout history, right? Like mm. I'm thinking about Paris and like thirties and forties and all the great writers that came out of that era or like, or more on the music side, like Brooklyn in the early two thousands and all that, like new rock that was coming out of there. Like, I feel like moments like that happen where it's just like, there's something special about that, that place in that time that I'm sure there's like economic indicators and like other things about um, you know, why artists converge in the places that they do. Um, but yeah, to be, to be alive and in that era and one of those, we'll, we'll catch, we'll catch a wave at some point, Dave, maybe we'll be in our seventies <laughs> and we'll find ourselves in a like highly artistic, like place where there's people are just making the most beautiful things. Listen, I will still be recommending albums to my friends when I'm 70 <laughs> years old. So same, be just fine. All right, let's do honorable mentions real quick. Wait, 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 I, before we get oh, to that, ahead. I kind of want to, I want to ask you just where jazz in general falls for you. Like, where do you, do you yeah. grab for it in general or do you no. like, where's the, the genre? Cause you definitely speak with this appreciation of it. Yeah. Um, similar to I do, but I think similar to me, if I'm reading you right. It's not not necessarily a go to genre necessarily. It was at one point in my life. It hasn't been. I think something that is true is that it has been entirely subsumed by electronic music for me, because mm. there are there are some. I actually there's this record label called Pampa Records that I was going to talk today about or talk about today in my uh, recommendation or you know, what I've been listening to this week. Um, there's sort of this this thing happening amongst a certain group of of musicians that just really have my number. Um, they just like are making music perfectly tuned to my ears. And I think over time, just like going so deep into electronic music and certain subgenres of that has in some way taken the space that used to be inhabited by jazz. I think I went to jazz for, I don't know if inspiration is the right word, but I went to jazz because I wanted to be in the presence of amazing musicians playing amazingly. And I appreciated that there wasn't necessarily the same type of song structure that I was used to with like modern rock. Um, mm. I appreciated that these guys could just follow their whims and see where we go. And the whole group is behind them. You know, there's, there's always metaphors about jazz because they're true. Like there's sort of this rhythm section that's laying enough of a safety net that you can just do wild things on top of it. As long as you're staying within the same, you know, kind of playing field boundaries of the song that's being created. Um, I really loved listening to these artists doing those things. And there are some records that I still put on pretty regularly. I still listen to Bill Evans Sunday at the village Vanguard as like a go-to sitting around the house record, uh, kind of blue, you know, I'll throw that on any day of the week. And that's, that's great. Um, Mega saw um is one of my like like that one feels really personal to me like I felt like it was mine mm. for a long time um, do you remember like when we had AOL instant message names like we had to choose our like <laughs> course, name yeah so my name was Dave uh, um based on the Mega saw <laughs> yes. um record <laughs> that's excellent <laughs> and uh, I just remember uh, really really deeply loving those and so. Um, but yeah, something's shifted. I don't, I don't reach for it very often and I'm not as interested in, I know that I've only scratched the surface of what is out there yeah. and I'm not super interested in going deeper with it. And, and that's probably to my detriment. Uh, and I don't know, I just, it doesn't, it feels like it's over. And, and every now and then something new will happen. And I'll think like, whoa, like jazz music. This is cool. Like I've got a, a friend who makes really gorgeous music, who's a professional jazz musician. I, I really admire and respect the work that he does. And he put out an album a couple of years ago. Um, his name is Quentin Coxum, if you want to look him up. Um, 
I think the record was called You and I. I'll, I'll look that up real quick while I'm talking. Um, you know, he's just a, a buddy of mine in Chicago, and he's making beautiful music. And so I assume there are thousands of other people <laughs> making beautiful music, and yeah. I would really appreciate it if I gave it the time of day. I think yeah. I think a lot of it started sounding the same. I think a lot of it started sounding safe and, and kind of mass-produced. Uh, you know, I when I would listen to, like, Wynton Marsalis or, or, you know, kind of the more modern jazz giants it didn't hit me the same way it didn't feel as organic and as like edgy and like kind of like lightning in a bottle it didn't feel like you just kind of stumbled into a room where some amazing musicians were coming up with something new it felt like it had a sheen on it that i didn't like there was a you know some sort something in the production quality that i didn't i just didn't like so i've just fallen away from it but uh, you know, I'm sure I'm missing out on a lot of amazing yeah. stuff. I mean, I think what's it actually makes total sense that electronic has replaced it in your mind because I think in a lot of ways, the you know people really pushing the envelope with electronic music now are like the jazz musicians of the 50s and 60s in the like pure creation they were playing with, um, and I think that they would actually appreciate that now out of the like electronic musicians because I think that. I think what's true is that um, it did, as it became popularized, and, and especially as it became embedded in popular culture. I mean, how many like jazz songs can you kind of like be like, oh yeah, that song, even if you don't know the name of it, because you've sure. heard it in like, like four or five heard movies. Five and, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so I think some of the stuff, especially some of the stuff from the fifties and sixties, has just gotten so overused in popular culture. I mean, maybe not bitches brew, you know, like, but, but some of the, uh, some of the like more accessible stuff, um, that it kind of lost an edge, um, where it used to be something really dangerous. And I think today, I think electronic is usually, is at least in the mix of something that still feels dangerous, not accessible to everyone, still experimental in a lot of ways. Um, still you know of the people if that makes sense so i think that makes sense yeah by the way quentin's album is uh called you and i so go check that nice. out nice um i will just just we don't have to spend a lot of time on this i'll just say i i also don't reach for it for um some of the same reasons although i don't think i went quite as deep on it as you did i don't think i went much past miles davis coltrane um Thelonious monk i love um, I did listen to some like more recent stuff like Heliocentrics. I think it's really cool. Um, but you know, you're right. It's just the, the, the more modern, uh, stuff doesn't surface for me that much. So I don't even know, like I'd have to, I'd have to really go digging for it. Yeah, that's true. I, every now and then Pitchfork will recommend something that's in kind of a jazz vein and I'm yeah. always happy to listen to it. I, I always think like, okay, here we go. Let's do this. And it's always wonderful. And then I just don't listen to it again for four months. You know, there was a there was a record a couple of years ago that was like a Floating Points and and Pharaoh Sanders record uh, that that was my favorite record of the year. Um, but it wasn't. I don't know. It was jazz, but it wasn't exactly. I don't know. It it lived in a different <laughs> space. It didn't feel like it was part of a larger conversation. Uh, you know, the, uh, of other music that was that was out at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Tell me your honorable mentions. Yeah, well, I already mentioned a couple of them. I mean, um, for this particular uh, this particular topic, I definitely like looked at my catalog of jazz in terms of um, what would would be up there with with the birth of the cool. I think Bitches Brew definitely came to mind, and I have put that on when I'm working sometimes. But I think I find the the more experimental nature of it more distracting. I actually found Bitches Brew really fun to listen to on the train when I was commuting years ago, and I'd be like, oh my god, he's playing music like my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so I thought of that, but then I also thought of, like, Minor Threat. I didn't, I think just in general, like, Minor Threat, Misfits, some of that great hardcore punk I, is a go-to for me when I'm working. I ended up not going that direction because... I didn't think that it would necessarily be the same vibe that everyone would want to have while they're working. And I think that Birth of the Cool, I would definitely, I think anyone can like put that on and enjoy it. And and to me, I think get work done. Um, and I think that I also thought of some like more popular, probably still a little more indie um, albums like Passion Pits, Manners came to mind for me. 
Um, again, something that's like more upbeat and energetic and bright. Um, that kind of sets the right vibe for me while I'm working. What were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that there's a million uh, early 2000s electronic records that that I could put into this scenario. I'm just going to list. I'm just going to do a list. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> it's like yeah, Bonobo, Thievery Corp, you know, Kruder and Dorfmeister, Pete Rock's Pete Strumentals. Have you ever listened to Pete Strumentals? No, but I love that name. Uh, you know, it's just great hip hop instrumental hip-hop stuff uh tosca telephone tel aviv who i somehow keep mentioning on this podcast i don't listen to telephone tel aviv that often but they've come up like four podcasts now uh cinematic orchestra and peace orchestra two different bands two different vibes but all great uh amon tobin basically all of the ninja tune releases if you just go look for the ninja tune label in the early 2000s Everything could You're fit making that into up. That's not a real thing. No, Ninja Tune. You just made that up. No, it's the best. Uh, and then, you know, classic stuff like Ulrich Schnauss. Um, you know, there's a treasure trove. Pick your poison. You know, if, and if it's Album Leaf and Tycho, if that's if that's your vibe, do it. Go for it. I get no judgment from me other than there are better things than Album Leaf and Tycho. And I like Album Leaf and Tycho, but there are better things out there. They just seem to be at the top of every list, like listicle on the internet. I know. Of like music to listen to. At a I think I've had the experience of putting on Album Leaf and trying to work and being like, nope, not, <laughs> can't do it. Nope, this is yeah. not the vibe I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Canon, let's talk Canon for a second. Uh, Mushroom Jazz does not go into my Canon, although I... I, if there was a place for YouTube's lo-fi hip hop beats <laughs> to study to, uh, if that could go into my canon, it might <laughs> <laughs> just, just by like amount of time spent with it. But no, yeah. that mushroom jazz not in mine. Birth of the Cool in yours? Oh, Birth of the Cool is definitely in mine. I think that um, a Birth of the Cool and Kind of Blue, just surprise, surprise, um, both of those would make it into my canon, I think. But um, I, again, just for pure repeatability i think i've probably at least in recent years listened to birth of the cool more and just uh such a seminal album i mean how can you not put it in the canon so it's going in there for me yeah i don't i don't know that i'm ready to put kind of blue in the canon tonight only because i know that record's going to come up again on a future conversation sure. so is that what it means if you put it in the canon we can never talk about it no again? no, no. it just means that i want to like properly anoint it at some is point is the canon cause... like a vault and we put it in and then we close the door and then you're like you're not <laughs> no, able to access the vault anymore it's a museum that you can walk down the halls to but we have to give it each record it's due we can't put kind of blue in the canon when we haven't ah. spent 30 minutes talking about kind of blue yeah we that's have to fair. so tonight we can put birth of the cool in the canon absolutely we're gonna we're gonna put birth of the cool in the canon and then we're gonna put kind of blue at the door to the canon (laughs) ready to be talked about (laughs) yeah so send us a send us a topic that birth that kind of blue fits for (laughs) and it will be in the canon (laughs) uh all right let's talk quickly about what you've been listening to this week because i have a super weird pick for this uh but i want to hear what you've listened to first Dave has a super weird pick. No, but for this his is like music. a weird, this is a weird <laughs> circumstantial pick. Like it's, uh, you'll hear it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with an album that we were talking about that came up when we were talking about Donnie Trumpet recently, and you and I both were like, "Oh, Nico Segal has a new album it's called Tell the Ghost Welcome Home." Just again, ah, I love it when I these titles are so good. Um. I'm really enjoying it. I've been putting it on this week. It's super, it's got the same kind of vibe as Surf in, in that it's like, speaking of jazz, it's got jazz elements, but it's like jazz mixed with hip hop. And then you throw in some like cameos by Jamil Woods um, and some, you know, some other great Chicago artists. So um, put it on. I, I've been, I've been finding this really fun to put on in the background while I work this week, actually. So, you know, like in a few weeks, maybe this will be my coffee shop vibe. Who knows? I got it. I want to I want to check that album out. I I you know we talked a little bit about this last week already, but I really like him and the music he's made in the past. So uh, it's been an all jazz night uh, yeah. for us, mushroom jazz and birth of the ghoul. And now I'm going to break it. The thing that I have been listening to this week, <laughs> although along the same lines uh, as the conversation we've been having, so. When I say that I love Pampa Records, I it like it like means something to me. That record label means something to me. And DJ Cozy uh, is like in for my taste. I'm not necessarily prescribing this on the world, but for my taste, the most exciting musician in the world right now. Every time he releases something, I think like, oh, this is so special. And there's some something he's tuned into that nobody else seems to be. And it's this kind of like. An intersection of whimsy and and hauntedness and 
and beauty and like deep fun. Like it's, it's very inspired by disco and it's just everything he puts out, like the sounds that he makes, uh, the, 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 the way that he, uh, turns one thing into another thing. It is so cool to me. And, uh, every time he announces new music, I think like, Oh, what if it's not as good? Like, what if it's, what if it's not as good as the last one? And, and, you know, both of his like full length, not both of his, his two last full length albums are easily in top 20 records for me of all time. I, I just love them so much. Anyway, he's producing this album with Royce and Murphy. That's been really exciting. So there's going to be some new DJ cozy type music coming out, although it's a Royce and Murphy album first yeah. and foremost. Uh, however, he just this week announced that he's putting out a new record next year and he's releasing a couple songs in the next month or so, uh, that, is meant to sort of be an appetizer for that record. I'm not totally clear if those songs will be on the record, but they are meant to be sort of like, here's where my headspace is right now. Here's the type of music that I've been creating. He goes on and on about how he uh, made this music at like a Benedictine monastery, uh, huh. lying on his stomach, um, doing heroin kebabs. I don't know what heroin kebabs are. <laughs> they don't fit that? within my sense of Benedictine <laughs> monasteries, but... To each his own, apparently. <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing that I've been listening to this week over and over again is a 60, maybe 30 second snippet <laughs> of this new DJ Cozy song that's coming out in a month that he put on Instagram. And I just keep putting it on repeat because it blew my mind. Like, I, I was I was like queuing it up and I was like, OK, let's see if this is cool. And oh, my gosh, <laughs> like it like I literally got chills all over my spine and my neck. such an incredible oral experience for 30 seconds that like i just keep clicking on it like you would like an itunes preview like i just keep <laughs> listening to it over and over again and i'm not recommending this to anyone i'm not telling you to go rush out and listen to a 30 second snippet of dj cozy but if i'm giving an honest answer of what i've been listening to this week it's kind of this <laughs> I've been listening Dave, to a 30 Dave, second instagram I wanna, clip i want to recap for our <laughs> listeners yeah please. i want to recap for our listeners you are you are recommending a thirty second Not recommending. Clip on Instagram. <laughs> you are recommending a thirty <laughs> second clip on Instagram as your listen of the week. That's did right. I get that? Did I get that? Straight? That's correct. I mean, you know, I could talk about Queens of the Stone Age for a minute. I've been spending more time with that record. That's been a, ah, that's nice. a great album. I like it. Nice. It sounds like classic Queens of the Stone Age, and and is you know. Uh, as as good as anything they've put out recently, and and uh, I'm I was having a, it was a slow build for me, but now I'm into it. Uh, I probably put it in their top five records uh, oh, right okay. out of the gate. So if you need like a real full throated recommendation this week, it's like if I must you can spend give some time like a, with Queens of the Stone Age album, but I got to tell the- you, Caleb album focused podcast yes what i gotta tell you the second that dj goes he put this 30 second snippet out i didn't listen to queens of the stone Age anymore that week <laughs> just being honest man if i can't bring my full self to this podcast what is it for <laughs> you know what me and all the listeners at home love your passion dave i think that has been a common point of feedback I've um, had I've had significant fights with people, not fights. I've had significant arguments with people about putting DJ Kobe al- DJ Cozy <laughs> album so high on my year end list. They're like, "Really? This?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, this, this is it. <laughs> this, this is as good as music gets in the, the heart. 2020s. Wants what it wants." <laughs> <laughs> I have been enjoying the uh, the singles coming off this Royce and Murphy um, album so far. Yeah, so Faders maybe on this a cool one. Yeah, check out the video for Fader. It's I think I said that last week. The video for Fader is, is uh it's really yeah. really wonderful. Fun. All right, man. Well, we will be back at it next week. Sincerely send us your topics because they will become uh fodder for future episodes. Uh and we will we'll certainly shout you out if you want to be shouted out and we'll let you even pick a record if you have one to pick. That's um, right. So, uh, you know, send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Of course, give us some positive ratings on iTunes or Apple Podcasts if you are inclined to we really appreciate it thanks for a great launch so far um and we will see you next week yeah tell us what 30 second clip you would like us to review next week (laughs) best 30 second clip for (laughs) dave's mind expanding (laughs) 
It's a twelve-part podcast, <laughs> six <laughs> hours each. On a Thirty so second actually clip. only like six <laughs> minutes long. <laughs> Just wait till the actual song comes out. <laughs> and I just spend the whole podcast talking about it. All this makes it in. It. All this is in. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs>